Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this webcast presentation from IJ Global and Natixis. My name is Ken Molay, and I'm going to be making sure that you have a smooth and easy viewing experience today. I would like to introduce your moderator and facilitator for the day, Mr. Tom Nelthorpe. Tom Nelthorpe is executive editor of IJ Global. Tom, go ahead, please. Thanks very much, Ken. Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to IJ Global's European Midstream Energy Roundtable and webinar. Um, thank you very much for joining us, uh, and we look forward to your questions and comments throughout the session. Uh, my name, as Ken mentioned, is Tom Nelthorpe, uh, and I'm IJ Global's executive editor. Uh, this roundtable and webinar is brought to you in association with Natixis, which we uh, thank for its support. Uh, we will structure this event with a short presentation that draws on IJ Global's data uh, to give you an idea of what activity has been like in uh, this sector. We'll then hold a panel discussion with some very experienced sponsors, lenders, and an advisor. I'm going to remind you uh, in advance of our participants before we, we start looking at some slides. Um, we'll introduce them after the slides as well. Um, but they are uh, myself, uh, Ian Cogswell, Managing Director and Global Head of Natural Resources at Natixis, Paul Corcoran, uh, Chief Financial Officer at Nord Stream, uh, Nicholas Lucas, he's uh, uh, in uh, Allianz Global Investors, uh, responsible for debt investments. Uh, Vitz Selick, he's a partner in Prague, White & Case, and George Grant, uh, Managing Director at Stag Energy. Uh, this next slide uh, serves to give you some of our reasons for holding this webinar at this uh, point in time. Um, IJ, IJ Global felt this was one of the best opportunities we've had uh, really in some time to look at this market. Uh, we'd love to hear from you if you have a different or possibly more nuanced take on these factors, um, but here they are. Uh, I think we're looking at increased political tension in Eastern Europe, uh, starts of uh, evidence of cooling commodity prices, excess natural gas production in the U.S., still solid demand for gas from Asian consumers, a continued strong debt market liquidity, uh, and increased enthusiasm on the part of institutions uh, for exposure to regulated infrastructure assets. Without further ado, uh, now we'll move on to some of the data we pulled from IJ Global's database. Uh, 13,000 transactions and 10,000 projects, if you'll permit the brief plug. Uh, this presentation was, was put together by Manjot Gobinpuri. Uh, he's our head of uh, data analysis. Um, what you're looking at here uh, are the recipients of project financed in debt investments since 2010 uh, by country, uh, also split by year. Um, what sticks out immediately, really, is how dominant Russia is, um, but also how lumpy uh, that investment in Russia is. It will not be much of a surprise for you to learn that Nord Stream accounts for nearly all of that. Uh, that of course, given that the pipeline runs under the Baltic to Germany, you might argue that it's not a completely Russian uh, investment destination. Germany, therefore, at a, at number two, has a case for being number one, although much of its financing and investment activity has been uh, either, um, or usually the, the acquisition of distribution networks. Spain, at number three, has been active in, in procuring gas importation infrastructure although not all of its projects have been successful. Um, finally, Norway um, at number four is something of an outlier. Um, while its gas-led pipeline has been the subject of some M&A activity, um, quite a lot of shipping um, connected to oil and gas transportation also registered under those, um, those totals. Our next slide looks at total financing activity in the sector, as well as breaking it down by source. Um, shows a fairly solid decline in, in financing activity uh, most of it involving equity and commercial banks between 2010 and 2012. Then there's a good pickup in activity and a sizable bond component uh, in 2013 before, before falling back so far this year. Um, much of that bond activity related to the financing um, of the Castor underground gas storage project, uh, which was the debut of the, the European Investment Bank's project bond credit enhancement. Uh, the concession for that project, unfortunately, has recently been terminated, uh, but the structure will probably still serve as a template for other European gas storage financing. Uh, this quick penultimate slide just gives you an idea of average transaction and average debt sizes um, over the last few years. Gives you a rough gauge as to what's happening to gearing as well, uh, assuming that the relationship between average transaction size and average debt size can highlight that. Uh, we have a rough increase in, in gearing from the start of our series, and an increase in transaction size in 2012. Um, our hunch is that's based on the open grid uh, refinancing closing in a quiet year, uh, and then a gentle reduction over the last two years. But you can also see that um, compared to other sectors, average transaction size is large. So these are, are lumpy and these are complex financings. But that's just a quick look at which sponsors have been most active in the space. Um, this has a few surprises. Gazprom's in the lead. Um, C-Drill is a bit of an anomaly. It's a Norwegian headquartered 
um, operator of fairly movable oil and gas infrastructure. Uh, and behind uh, those guys are uh, um, primarily a group of financial and strategic sponsors. Um, but I guess the question for this afternoon is what this chart would look like in the next five years, what assets will be most attractive, uh, and what deals can get done. So I'm now going to introduce again um, our participants. Um, I'll start off again. Um, Ian Cogswell, he's a managing director uh, and global head of natural resources at the Texas, and has been uh, uh, one of the lead bankers on a number of, of European oil and gas financings. Um, next up, we have Paul Corcoran. He's chief financial officer at Nord Stream. Um, I think it's fair to say probably, um, uh, while it's technically a project company, it's essentially a very established um, project finance energy borrower in its own right by now. Uh, next up, we have uh, Nicolas Lucas. He's uh, a vice president at Allianz Global Investors, responsible for debt investments. Uh, and then on the line, we have Vit Stelic. He's a partner in Prague at White & Case. Uh, his uh, uh, recent representative matters uh, include project development with a, with a focus on Eastern Europe. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Darlene from uh, Edinburgh, I believe, is George Grant. He's a managing director at Stag Energy, uh, which is, uh, among other ventures, developing a gas, pro gas storage project uh, in the Irish Sea. I'd now like to um, put our first um, fairly general question to the, uh, to the panel, um, and that's whether given this political and commodity price uh, backdrop, it's uh, too early to talk about a realignment uh, of Europe's gas supply sources. Um, maybe I can start with you, George. Um, I think the, the short answer uh, as to whether it's too early to talk about realignment is, is no. Um, I think it's extremely timely. Uh, we're seeing significant changes to the sources of, uh, of European gas, and, and not only changes to the sources, but um, we're seeing significant changes to the flexibility or swing capacity from those existing supplies. Uh, and that's all at a time when we're seeing gas becoming an increasingly important uh, element in managing security of supplies or security of energy supplies as we see reducing volumes of coal uh, in the energy mix uh, over the next uh, 10 to 15 years. <clears throat> so, I mean, it, it, as a sort of brief uh, summary of the things that I uh, see uh, as, I guess, significant, um, you know, Russia clear, clearly is, um, you know, remaining as, as supplying about a third of Western Europe's uh, gas, but uh, perhaps leave it to, to talk more about that. Um, the supplies that we're seeing from the UK continental shelf, uh, Norway and Netherlands are all in decline, and that the flexibility or swing from all of those sources is also in, in decline. Um, so we're seeing a situation where Europe is becoming increasingly reliant on uh, LNG, uh, from Middle East, Africa, uh, Caribbean, and we're seeing the prospect of North American uh, LNG starting to, to play a role in the market. And we're also hearing a lot of talk about, you know, what part is unconventional gas going to, to take in uh, or play in Europe. So uh, I think as the supply sources become more distant, um, we're seeing uh, increasing exposure uh, to disruption in, in the supply channels, uh, and increasing exposure to global uh, gas market uh, price spikes. Uh, security is, is uh, clearly a major issue uh, that, that uh, I guess economies need to uh, be very focused on. So I think the, 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 the question, you know, is, is it too early to talk about realignment um, or how, how the uh, realignment is evolving? I think absolutely not. It's very timely and uh, certainly our sort of politicians should be very focused on it. So, so if it, looking at things um, from the other end of the, the, the continent, um, and given, given how active you are in developing or advising on, on development in Eastern Europe, um, how do things look, look, look from your end of things? Are, are we seeing a realignment? I think we, we, we are seeing a realignment um, because um, if you look at what the Commission, the EU Commission has already um, said on this topic um, as a result of the Russian-Ukrainian crisis back in May this year, uh, you clearly see that one of the eight pillars for, the, for improving energy security is uh, achieving more, more diversity as to uh, the sources of um, gas supply. 
Um, so clearly, um, the politicians, at least uh, in Brussels, are fully aware of the need to um, uh, improve the position of uh, Europe as, as a market. And uh, in Eastern Europe, especially to um, try to be less dependent on Russian gas. Um, yet, this is obviously a very sensitive topic. Uh, you have to take into account that uh, um, although we are talking about Russia as, as a country, the, uh, the business is done by uh, Russian companies. Most of them are owned by the state, but nonetheless they are businesses and they have long-term contracts um, with uh, European companies. So um, you have to, and so far the contracts are being more or less honored by all parties. So um, it's difficult to legally to, to say, well, there is no longer uh, need for Russian gas, so let's, let's move elsewhere and let's uh, direct all investments uh, into uh, the southern corridor, for example, to Caspian Sea. I mean, this uh, this would be probably something which would cause more trouble than, than bring benefits. So I think it is a combination of um, uh, uh, promoting LNG, as, as mentioned by George, um, uh, uh, trying to uh, connect European countries so that we better deal with the supplies, we, supplies of gas we, we get. And vis-a-vis -vis Russia, probably the most difficult um, topic to resolve, um, I think we have to realize that they will need the European market at least for some time, uh, although they are trying to reach a deal with, um, uh, with uh, countries from Asia like China, uh, India. Um, this will take time. The infrastructure is yet to be built. So I think we have some time left to uh, get prepared for the new situation in the, in the gas world to come. But uh, um, to answer the question is on, the, on the slide, it is definitely not too early. I think it's, it's getting a bit uh, too late because uh, every investment, any investment in gas infrastructure take, take a significant uh, time. And I think it's, it's very timely, as, as George said. I, I, fully, I fully agree. We, we, have to, we have to act. The, the Commission has to act, European countries as well, and I think there are several projects underway which, which, are, to the, which are directed uh, exactly to achieve uh, more diversity. So, Paul, you're a, a major new source of, of Russian gas into, into Europe. What's your, what's your take on the uh, alignment of, of Europe's energy supply? Yeah, I think I'd, I'd agree with the two previous speakers uh, in the sense that it's uh, never too early to start talking about security of supply and, and diversity of sources. But I think this is a discussion, actually, that's been going on for years. Um, and Europe's in an excellent position in that it has Norway, Russia, the Middle East, North Africa, all more or less on its doorstep. But the practicality of the diversity is a different matter. And in reality, Norway isn't going to be producing significant volumes of, the future, of gas in the future. Um, moving gas from the Middle East, we see, is a very difficult uh, yeah. process, especially if we're looking at pipelines. LNG is a different matter, but the question on LNG, as uh, George said, is in the end price. At what price does it land in Europe? Um, North Africa, again, it's difficult to see given the, the political situation in Egypt, Libya, uh, and, the, and the, in Algeria also with the terrorist activity, um, that those countries are going to be a new source of gas in the near future. And then the reality is that leaves Russia or LNG. And coming back to the contract position, you know, Europe's taking probably 150 to 170 BCM over the past years, typically, of Russian gas. But if you look at the fact that most of that gas is delivered on long-term contracts, and these contracts ending to 2030 and beyond, uh, we also see that there's a very secure position for Europe with 2020, uh, about 125 BCM still contracted under long-term contracts, and in 2030, that's about 70. Um, and I think, rather, Europe should be looking at uh, the opportunities uh, to secure the delivery of this extra gas, because the alternative is either a different source of energy, such as coal, which is not really great for the environment, or it's LNG, in which 
case you're competing with the Asian market and uh, paying prices very significantly more than the Russian price uh, for pipeline gas. So I, my view is the security question is rather one of security of supply and Nord Stream, of course, contributes to that uh, in uh, its 55 BCM, which now comes uh, on an independent route from Russia. Ian Cogswell, um, what, what sources of, of supply, um, whether existing or incremental, look most uh, most promising from, from where you're sitting? Well, I think from in, in terms of, um, of establishing which are the most likely new sources of supply, in many ways, it's easier to identify that by looking at the, 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 the pipeline of financings that we're going to see over the next 18 months or two years, because if we know what is going to be financed, then we have a fair idea of what is going to be built and therefore which, are these, which, which sources of gas we're going to see coming into Europe. With that in mind, if you look at um, financings that we expect to see, most of these are actually in Europe in either pipelines or gas storage. So whilst we do, uh, the point has been made by I think everybody else so far, LNG is clearly um, uh, a potential source of supply. We're not actually seeing a great deal of investment in regasif LNG regasification in Europe to, in order to, um, to achieve that, that diversification. The majority of the finance we're seeing is in, is in pipelines. Um, we're seeing a, a couple of years ago the, the, the development of the, the TANAP pipeline to bring gas from the Caspian. Originally, that was going to be project financed, but that was going to take such a long time that the sponsors decided to, to fund the development of TANAP with equity. That gives a clear indication that gas from the Caspian region um, is going to be one of the new sources. Of course, that's going to link into the either the, the, most likely the TAP pipeline, which will then bring gas into Italy, so bringing in from the south um, and potentially a, a, you know, a, a Nabucco solution as well. Um, we are also seeing developments in gas storage, and I'm sure, I'm sure George will, will touch on this as well. Um, there are companies that are moving into the European market, uh, U U.S. companies that are active in gas storage in the U.S. and are seeing the opportunities in Europe now um, for developing commercial gas storage much, um, much in the same way that commercial gas storage has been developed in the U.S. So even though we're seeing some opportunities in, in, in LNG, uh, recently the in, in West Africa, more and more LNG liquefaction projects being developed, and clearly from West Africa, Europe is, is not so far away and could be, um, you know, so the, the, the supply of gas from, from West Africa could be, could be significant. I agree with Paul that if you're competing with, if, if you're an LNG supplier and you've got the option of exporting LNG to, to Asia, or Europe, you're much more likely to try and choose an Asian export market because the price that you can achieve for that LNG is going to be higher. Um, so in answer to the question, what, which sources of gas look most promising, I think it's, 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 um, it's still pipeline gas from, from Caspian region. And um, who knows, we'll see maybe over the next few years the development of a, of a shale gas industry in Europe if if the regulation allows. I was going to say, and you, you partly answered that a little earlier, that if, if we were going to run our list of, of top sponsors in midstream globally, there'd possibly be one US company, Chenier Energy, that, that, would, that would maybe outdo what, what Wall Street's been raising. Um, I've sometimes remarked upon the disconnect between the volumes of debt that are being raised for, for liquefaction terminals in, in the US compared to activity in receiving terminals elsewhere. Does the Asian premium really account for that disconnect, or at some point, does, does the receiving capacity have to get built to, to accommodate this U.S. export? Well, at, at some point, receiving capacity—you know—receiving capacity has to be there. Otherwise, there's, there's nowhere for the LNG to go. Except, you know, Chenier could essentially um, take it next door and, and, and regasify, regasify it right next door to where they've liquefied it. But that, you know, 
um, the reality of it is the Asian market requires that gas more. It has fewer options in terms of gas supply. So it will be prepared to pay a premium to secure that supply. LNG is, is, um, is very flexible, and, and that's the route that they've gone down. And I think that if you look at some of the U.S. Um, LNG uh, projects that are under, develop under development now, they're all targeting that Asian market. Um, that could change, but I, I, the, the, the investment in regasification in Europe isn't there. Um, I'm sure there is capacity in the existing regasification terminals, but the new investment isn't there at the moment. Paul Cochrane, did you have a quick comment? Um, yeah, I think I think that's the, the point is that uh, the regas capacity in Europe is there in spades. So there's something approaching 200 BCM of regas capacity in Europe. Um, where it's missing is in uh, the eastern and southern, uh, southeastern areas, but there are a couple of projects which are uh, going to fill that gap. The problem is that the usage last year was about 40 uh, BCM, just over 40 BCM. So it's got a 20%, uh, 22% utilization, and I think there's, there's very li relatively little need for investment in European regas capacity. Um, because the key question at the end of the day is what price are consumers willing to pay uh, for the LNG that's coming in? And at the moment, they're not prepared to pay uh, the price to attract, for example, any spare uh, US LNG that may be available. Thanks, Paul. So the, 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 the market signal possibly have a little way to go. Let's look at the, um, the regulatory signals which um, our governments are giving us. Uh, do we think European governments are doing enough to support the, the development of new midstream infrastructure like storage, like LNG? Um, George, maybe you can offer us your uh, your perspective. Yeah, I, I think um, you know government intervention um, to support development of anything is is always a, a very sensitive subject um, because when we see market intervention then you know it often is the case that the market in effect ceases to function effectively as we've seen in the UK electricity market so um, we're getting a lot of push um, as Vit said from the European community for improving security of supply and improving interconnectivity um, but a lot of those projects, be they uh, pipeline or storage, are struggling without some form of, of uh, government regulatory framework, I guess. Um, and that's underpinned a lot of investment in gas storage around Europe. Um, and I think we need to sort of accept or acknowledge that there is a lot of uh, regulatory intervention um, or structure in, in Europe in general. So um, the market, there isn't as, as, as uh, clear and open a market as we have in the US where we've seen a, a lot of investment over the years in, in effectively merchant storage that's been underpinned by long-term contracts. So the, the question, should governments do more or are they doing enough? Um, our sort of recent experience has, has been very focused in the UK. Um, the UK government has deliberated the question over a number of years as to whether uh, in action uh, in terms of some sort of public supply obligation uh, should be required or should be imposed on the market. Uh, there was a recent decision uh, in September last year with the publication of a new gas security policy uh, where the government said that they were happy to see the market, um, I guess, deliver uh, in its own right. And that saw Centrica writing off £240 million um, on the bed gas storage development. And there's been very little uh, activity or progress with the remaining storage development projects um, since that point in time. So. It's one of those, uh, you know, difficult political questions as to is intervention required to provide consumers with greater price protection from from international markets, or are we going to rely on price signals um, pulling LNG into the UK 
uh, as and when required, which price signal means price going up, um, and therefore live with the level of uh, storage that we currently have. Um, so our view is that the UK has left the consumer very exposed given, uh, as we were talking about earlier, the distance um, or, or um, of supplies going forward and to get ourselves more in line with uh, most of the other European countries as uh, domestic uh, production from the UK uh, continental shelf de declines, um, we felt that the government should have been uh, putting a, a, a regulatory framework in place which is common across the continent. So from the UK's perspective, um, I don't think the government is doing enough. Um, I think if you're talking about storage elsewhere in Europe, um, many of uh, the European countries are relatively well served by facilities that have been built um, by state-owned utilities in the past, although there have been one or two projects in the last uh, five or six years that have come forward. Thanks, George. Uh, Ian? Yeah, I, mean, I think moving across to, to continent Europe as well, there is, um, there's, there's clearly been some you know, recent examples of uh, of government s supporting the midstream business, and I, you know, you can think of t two very relevant examples. And I think that it one shows how um, government support can increase prices, which is um, which is good for developers, and one that that supports debt finance. First of all, in France um, earlier this year, the French regulator um, issued a decree which. Um, uh, increase the amount of gas that gas um, distributors and gas um, transmission providers were required to keep in storage. Um, that immediately increased the amount of gas in storage in France and actually um, pretty much filled the, um, the, the, the storage capacity of the country. So that the impact straight away by that regulatory um, change was to um, to increase increase demand and therefore increase price. Well, you know, if you're saying uh, are European governments doing enough to support the development of, of the infrastructure? Well, they are if they do that. As well, it, the, the the big example that we have is uh, uh, that everybody's aware of is the Castor gas storage project in Spain. Um, the way that that uh, the project itself has clearly um, not progressed as everyone had hoped due to the seismic activity and and there was a huge amount of debt raised to to fund that project um, that the way that the Spanish government then behaved was going to dictate whether this type of investment was going to be possible in the future as I think everybody knows um, in in October there was a a, a a decree from the Spanish government that um, uh, the uh, effectively secures the compensation for the project sponsors of Castor. Um, the, 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 the decree formally terminated the concession for operating the project and it provides a clear framework for the repayment of the bonds, you know, 1.4 billion euros of, of bonds that were issued um, you know, just a year or so ago. What that does is it means that it, um, for similar projects in the future, lenders, investors are going to be comfortable, or hopefully comfortable, that the, the governments will support the development of this infrastructure where they have to. And, you know, again, in answering the specific answer to the question, are they doing enough? I think it's different across, as George has just mentioned, between governments, but I think that the governments are becoming aware that they have to support um, these infrastructure developments or they won't happen. Thanks, Ian. Um, uh, Nikos, I, I'm going to um, ask you as a um, major institutional debt provider to, to um, the ministry market, what do you look for in terms of regulatory treatment um, for um, midstream and mid to downstream gas infrastructure? Investors like stable cash flows, and therefore they like stable and predictable regulatory framework. So that's the reason why, for instance, they invest in regulated gas networks. The revenues are set by the regulator to cover the costs. The tariffs are reviewed on a regular basis, taking into account the CapEx program. There is no or quasi no volume risk, and that's why there's been so much investment in uh, gas transmission and distribution. Now, when it comes to sectors that are less 
fully regulated, like for instance gas storage facilities in certain countries on the continent where the revenues are not completely set by the regulator. The storage capacity is sold under long-term take or pay contracts, and this provides as well some visibility on the revenues and uh, supports uh, investors' appetite for the sector. Uh, Nicola, thanks. Um, uh, the, you, you, you touched in your, your earlier remarks of, uh, upon some of the, the policy initiatives that uh, govern um, pipeline development and, and, and gas network development in uh, Central Europe. Um, what, what do you look for in terms of stability and certainty? I think uh, uh, obviously for any investment, stability and predictability is is, is a must. Uh, what is what is important in the in the gas uh, transmission or transportation sector um, is that I think you have two types of uh, uh, situations if you want to build a new pipeline. You either have a big customer, um, like for example Gazprom, uh, who needs uh, the capacity so that it fulfills its uh, commodity commitments under the commodity contracts. And uh, practically this is your stable cash flow because um, the customer needs the capacity and you can build a new pipeline uh, on that basis. For that you need actually an, an exemption from various regimes set by the European legislation, be it third party access rules or ownership unbundling. So you, you, need, uh, you need basically exemptions from basic rules, then you can build a project on that basis. And this happened uh, in case of Nord Stream, which continued uh, to Germany uh, uh, in a project called Opal, Czech Republic, a project called Gazelle. And uh, basically more or less uh, the, the financing comes from, uh, or I would say predominantly comes from the, the customer of, um, or the, the, the shipper. Uh, to be precise. Uh, the other type of project is uh, basically <laughs> projects which probably uh, are needed because they, they are improving security of supply, uh, but you don't have a shipper or a customer for, for this uh, particular capacity um, uh, with a long-term contract which would sort of secure the stability uh, of, of, the, of the cash flow. And then you need to somehow distribute the, the, the cost of, um, of construction or developing uh, this new capacity um, between uh, uh, countries through which the, the, the pipeline is being built. Um, and for this, the European Union already uh, in 2013 created a, a sort of a special framework. It's called um, uh, Projects of Common Interest. And uh, it is foreseen that for a situation, uh, for the second type of investment, uh, the country should cooperate, should do a cost-benefit analysis, and allocate the cost of construction based on the benefits uh, of, of, of the new capacity. And um, uh, to some extent, the, the cost uh, will be uh, uh, paid by the domestic consumption, by the domestic users, uh, customers, or consumers, to be precise. Um, and partially, there might be a, you know, say, a certain volume risk, yeah, which is not sort of wanted, but um, there probably will always be a, at least a certain volume risk. And for this sort of second type of investments, obviously, uh, this imp has an impact on on the overall gas prices because the transmission part or transportation part um, gets more expensive. And it is about it is then about the regulators, the domestic regulators, how how they uh, sort of view this and uh, whether they are willing to uh, agree to basically uh, put this uh, investment into the into the uh, price paid by the local custom lo local consumers. So um, for for that you could also use uh, EU financing, but on a uh, uh, not for the probably full investment, but there are some there are some funds earmarked for these projects, so-called priority projects. I think up to five billion euros. So you can you can you can use it. But I think the fundamental question is the cost benefit aspect, um, because and I think this is for the future uh, to to be discussed. Because if Europe is to act as sort of one one voice. Uh, one country uh, or federation, uh, 
I think it is important to realize that certain projects, increasing circulatory supply built in, you know, somewhere in Eastern Europe, actually are increasing the circulatory supply for the rest of the Europe as well. So I think the the, the sort of the prospects in terms of uh, uh, regulatory framework lie in a reconsideration of the entire re regulatory framework in that um, the the cost should be spread around uh, the the EU states, EU countries, based on the cost and benefit analysis. This okay. would okay. probably improve the situation for the investment. Thanks very much, Seth. Paul? Yeah, I think the, the picking up some of the, the comments that the other colleagues have made, in the end it's companies mostly that invest in projects, not really governments. Governments can help, um, and we shouldn't forget that it's the company's return, not necessarily the return on debt, uh, that is the perspective that the company looks at. And I think in some respects, uh, the regulated uh, system is indeed a drag on investment because uh, the limitation of investment, uh, the regulated return, uh, in, all, in a lot of cases, especially with big energy companies, doesn't reach the internal hurdle rate for that company and therefore um, capital is allocated towards other projects within those large groups. Uh, which do meet the hurdle rate, and that's that's bad news for Europe's infrastructure. Um, I think the uh, governments make uh, some contribution in the sense of the, for example, the European uh, Energy Programme for Recovery, where they've allocated around four billion as support for projects, which look at the integration of markets uh, and, and connectivity and reverse flow and all of those things, uh, and in that case they do support. Uh, investments, especially um, in the eastern side of Europe, uh, but also the uncertainty that sometimes Brussels generates around regulations and around what will be the rules uh, is a problem. And Vid made the point about uh, exemptions. Actually, a company shouldn't need to get an exemption in order for the project to provide a return in order for it to uh, invest. The system should be such that the company is prepared to invest without the exemption. And it is a sad, uh, a sad case that many projects uh, are looking for exemptions and indeed, as we see in the Opal discussion, uh, don't always get exemptions. Um, and that, in the end, becomes a discouragement for investment. Thanks, Paul. I, I'd like to turn very briefly to a question we got from um, from our audience. Um, hopefully this is yes or no, or close to yes or no. Um, as European gas sources start to di diversify geographically, um, can we expect to see less integrated and generally speaking smaller gas suppliers uh, or importers be pushed out of the market or otherwise that this could impact merger patterns within the sector? Um, could, I, could I turn to you, Ian? <clears throat> you can do. Um, I think that if you're looking at pushing, you know, the, the, the question is, you know, will 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 diversification um, push push the smaller suppliers out of the market? I, I don't think it should personally. I think the diversification should give good opportunity for for some of the smaller suppliers. Um, and, and I want to take the, the question more um, just beyond suppliers. Again, I think that. You, Supplier isn't just the supplier of gas, but the supplier of the infrastructure that, that allows that gas to flow. And again, we go back to storage. I think if you've got more diversification, you can perhaps have um, you know, the development of smaller storage. I, so I think that it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to push the smaller, um, the smaller players out of the market. You asked for a yes or no answer. It's as close as I can get. <laughs> No problem. We're going to move on to another um, question now, and this is about the role of financial investors in providing development capital. Um, is this something that a savvy developer can do with financial debt or equity, um, or is this a big boy with a balance sheet game? Um, maybe I could ask you to look at this first, uh, George. I think the, the, the question um, on 
the, the sense, what, what role do financial investors play in providing development capital? I think it's useful to clarify um, what that means. Uh, it, it, to my mind, development is, is kind of the upfront um, pre-construction, um, which tends to come from equity. It's the, the high risk. Um, and if one is also talking about construction, um, I think it's a point that uh, Nicola made um, a little earlier that for these projects, um, ideally to get uh, cost of capital down, um, you want to get into the debt and bond markets. But to do that, you really need to have a well um, bounded um, or a lot of confidence, let's say, in your sort of long-term revenue uh, forecasts. And that's when we get into this dynamic that was just being talked about uh, a moment ago about regulation versus, um, in essence, free market. If we get into regulated assets, um, you know, how much intervention is there and how often are those regulations going to change? Um, and it does tend to push an expectation from governments that a regulated asset should be earning a relatively low return. Uh, therefore, the certainty associated with, re with the revenues should be pretty high. If we have got a, a very open uh, market um, and therefore a sort of financing on a merchant basis, then governments and regulators have to be comfortable um, that participants are going to earn uh, a, a decent or higher uh, rate of return because it is uh, a merchant um, project and, and therefore you know, as an unregulated return, then there's an awful lot more uncertainty associated with that. And, and I think, you know, we, we've got a lot of diversity uh, throughout Europe as to which elements of the market are regulated and how highly regulated they are. Um, governments are talking about the level of investment required in infrastructure in general, not just in, in the gas sector. Um, and the need to access private sector um, finance, um, the, uh, the bond markets, the pension markets. And if those sectors are to be accessed, then the risk associated with the projects needs to be low. So it's perhaps a slightly rambling response to your question, but um, the risk-reward balance is, is very important when governments and regulators are looking at how they can encourage investment into, into the sector. The financial sector is keen to, to, to participate, but there is a, uh, you know, a limit as to how much risk they can realistically take on. Thanks, George. That, that actually takes us fairly nicely to, to our, our next question. Given that regulatory support, right or wrong, um, for, for midstream, uh, and given that it's been almost designed to attract this, this long-term debt, how successful has it been in, in, in attracting that debt? Nicola? Well, very successful, actually. Um, if you look at gas networks operators across Europe, they are repeated bond issuers uh, through corporate bonds or more structured bonds, like, for instance, in the UK. Um, acquisi acquisition bank debt uh, for uh, big transactions in the midstream sector are typically refinanced uh, with long-term bonds. Um, in addition, there is a new trend in the market with the emergence of institutional investors like Allianz Global Investors and others, which are capable of providing large tickets in single transactions and playing the role of anchor investor in large debt raising. So overall, there is a lot of uh, capital uh, available to be um, uh, invested in the sector. Uh, typically, uh, Allianz Global Investors, we can get involved uh, at the refinancing stage and also potentially earlier as we can take construction risk, uh, depending on the security package. Now, there may be some debate in the market on um, compression on returns or spread uh, compression. Um, as an institutional debt investor, uh, we focus on the returns, and we also focus on the credit risk. Uh, we need to make sure that the transactions are properly structured. It does happen that there is a weakening of credit terms on certain transactions, uh, which is difficult as it increases the risk profile. Uh, Ian, do you think that um, uh, the, the, the Nicholas's um, observation is, is fair about um, about the risk reward, risk reward um, profile in um, in uh, midstream debt? 
I think it is fair. I think that um, you know, if you look at you know on on the bank debt side as well, you know the the banks have traditionally, or senior debt providers have traditionally been very good at taking construction risk on these projects, <clears throat> um, and then um, there has been great um, appetite for refinancing. Um, I think if you look at projects that are, um, you know, regulated asset base, t uh, revenue stream based projects, there's, there's, a, there's enormous appetite, and there's a point where. You can't really get much cheaper. I mean, there was a point maybe 10 years ago when, when banks were certainly lending at very low margins, um, and that's that's not re that's not going to return, I, I hope. Um, but I don't think it will. I don't think that I think banks' internal hurdle rates are higher now. That the, the regulation requires that that you you just have to have to lend at more appropriate rates. So where can they go? What can happen if you if you can't if you can't get pricing to go much lower? Then it could be that the the terms of the debt could be could be loosened and and banks or, or investors are are asked to increase their credit risk. Um, I don't see that it's happened yet, but that is, is is the next logical step if you can't if you can't shift pricing. Um, so, in, in given that um, that backdrop. Um, and looking again at the involvement of the European Investment Bank, um, that's been, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think the sole involvement of the, the project on credit enhancement in gas storage was on, was on or at least in its dream, mm -hmm. was on capital. And um, since then, it's, it's moved on very successfully into the transport sector. But, but given what we're hearing about fairly compressed spreads, is there still a role for enhancements like that in, in, in this sector? Oh, there's obviously there, there definitely is role for enhancement because the enhancement provides um, provides liquidity as well. I think if you look at some of the bigger projects, you, you still um, if we take you know, move a step back as well. The way things have evolved for banks over the last few years, um, probably um, hold levels are tend to be lower than they they once were. Banks want to diversify their portfolios more. They want to, 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 to distribute some of the debt that they, they raise, that they, that they provide, sorry. Um, the credit enhancement increases the amount of liquidity in the market. And if you're looking at projects the size of Castor um, in the you know, multi-billion euro um, sort of amounts, then increasing the sources of liquidity is a good thing. And the credit enhancement that's on offer, the EIB type structure, will help. And of course, as well, just you know, banks are are. are I, I keep saying banks, but it's not just banks; it's, it's all types of investors are, are are focused on credit risk. And I think sometimes it's it, it's forgotten that in 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 these institutions, credit risk is actually the key. Before you look at the return, you look at the credit risk, and and then if it's acceptable, you'll be looking at the return you're going to make and whether it meets your internal hurdles. Um, any type of credit enhancement is beneficial. Thanks, Ian. I'm, I'm conscious we've gone a little bit over our, our scheduled um, finish time, but I'd like to give um, last word to um, a borrower in, in the sector, uh, a borrower that's been very, very successful in refinancings and repricings um, of its debt. Um, Paul Corcoran, um, do you think the returns available on debt investments in European mm -hmm. stream um, adequately reflect the risks? Um, I think, I think in our case, uh, the, the answer must definitively be yes, uh, because we have uh, five shareholders who've been prepared to take the risk and put up their equity portion uh, of the deal, and we've had 30 plus banks who've equally been prepared to step in and provide the financing. So, uh, I think the answer is yes. Interestingly, what we see is the development towards the debt capital markets, um, where because of the, the, as was said earlier, um, the long-term relationship of stable return, uh, stable cash flows, uh, being ideally suited to debt capital markets, uh, we think that's an area which uh, will develop in the future, and we certainly look at it. Thanks very much, Paul. I think I'm going to um, end it there. I'd like to thank our participants again, Ian, Paul, uh, Nicholas, uh, Vit, and uh, George. Um, would also uh, like to thank Graham Sherwood and Manjot Gobin Puri for their work uh, making this event happen. Uh, IJ Global is holding a European Renewables event um, covering another facet of the European 
security of energy supply picture uh, in late April 5th, uh, 2015 in Scotland. Um, please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any uh, questions about that event. But thank you very much for listening, and thanks again to our participants, and uh, have a good afternoon. And that does conclude our webcast. At this time, you can safely log off. Thank you so much for attending.